Everybody can hear me? Um, okay, so um, Cosmology for Machine Learning is my title. Um, here's my outline. Let me uh, skip this uh, for now, but these are my collaborators. That's important. Um, uh, before I proceed, I just want to give a one slide advertisement, which is not quite machine learning, but it's an advertisement of a method which uh, we are uh, advocating to be a good um, competitor to Monte Carlo micro chain methods. Um, here is a typical eight dimensional example of Planck data in cosmology. Um, these are our posteriors, 1D and 2D posteriors, compared to the MCMC. Uh, MCMC had a million calls, we had 100 calls, 150 calls. Here's another example uh, where we show that this is uh, in, in, a, in a galaxy registry survey uh, data, we have 125 calls versus, again, a million calls. Uh, here are the, sky, uh, the time scalings. Uh, our method is about uh, 10 to the 3 to 10 to the 4 times faster than MCMC and about 100 times faster than uh, stochastic variational inference. And that's due because uh, this method has no sampling noise, unlike KL divergence based uh, variational, stochastic variational method. Okay, that's all I want to say about this. Um, but let me talk about uh, generative models in cosmology. Um, the idea in cosmology is you start with some initial conditions which are Gaussian, and then you forward model them, uh, first uh, doing linear evolution and then doing nonlinear uh, um, evolution using uh, so-called M-body simulations. All right, so here's an example. You start uh, in the early universe. You know, this is, looks, this is a Gaussian field, and then you evolve it, and it becomes more and more non-Gaussian. Okay, so we have developed, for this purpose, we developed very specialized uh, fast M-body simulations, which called it, uh, we call it fast PM. It's been actually, I should, you know, right now we actually run 10 to the 12 uh, number of particles already. And we have a back propagation uh, through the simulation so we can have actually a gradient respect to initial conditions. Okay, so the forward model uh, in, in cosmology is basically a start with initial uh, Gaussian field, um, pass it through this M-body simulation to the d dark matter, and then pass it again through some nonlinear process, uh, which is called galaxy formation, and you know it's mostly a black box to get uh, galaxies. Uh, typically, we go um, intermediate step is this so-called dark matter halos, but it doesn't matter. Okay, so you know think of this process as being non-differentiable. Um, and uh, in our work, we then replace it with some differentiable um, uh, operation, which uh, I'll first show the neural network approach, and then I'll show something else. All right, so the basic idea is Gaussian field, nonlinear dark matter field, and then uh, galaxy light to the today. And this is what we observe. Okay, but the problem is that we want to solve is the inverse problem, right? We have the galaxy light today. We want to go and reconstruct the initial conditions. All right, so think of it as this uh, direction as being the forward model, uh, simulation, M-body simulation, a galaxy um, um, problem. And then, but we want to go backwards, right? So we want to do, uh, starting from the loss function, um, we want to reconstruct the initial conditions. So uh, the loss function is, uh, you can think of it as we have a prior, uh, which are these Fourier modes. They are the matrix is diagonal in Fourier space, so that's why you know, think of this as a, as a Fourier modes. And then we have this forward model, which takes these Fourier modes and um, you know, generates uh, an, a data. And then we have some noise source, typically, in the data. Uh, and this is the loss function we want to solve for. OK. so. Uh, and as I, as I mentioned, we, ha we do have the gradient, so we, you know, we, we actually solve this thing with, with about uh, you know, a few hundred uh, BFGS uh, iterations. Here's an example. Uh, again, this is the, on a simulation. This is uh, initial density, dark matter density, uh, light. This is what we observe. We train, we use just this, and this is how well we reconstruct. We reconstruct almost perfectly on the data, almost perfectly on the nonlinear dark matter. And you see on the initial uh, density, we uh, get the large scales. But we don't get the small scales, and that's because the small scales have been mapped to such small um, uh, galaxies that we don't actually observe them because we have a luminosity threshold on the galaxies, right? We can't really observe the faint galaxies w when they're far away. So that's why we lose um, high-frequency information. This, in this, uh, in for, for this example, we use the two, two million um, dimensional optimization. Okay, so um, here's another example of high noise versus low noise. If you have uh, uh, noise higher, you can still extract well in the data space, but you see you lose high frequency uh, information in this initial density. Okay, so this is not really what we care about. What we care about is the cosmological parameters. So what do we need to do? We need to marginalize out the latent space of these initial density modes, and we do this literally by doing a, a kind of a um, you know, multi, you know, million dimensional uh, integral, um, which we assume to be a Gaussian. 
And, uh, and that's how we are left then with the likelihood of the data given the, the cosmological parameters only, right? And then we try to maximize this. Uh, we try to do a Taylor expansion of this because we want to find where, the, where these peaks and what the covariance matrix is around the peak. Okay, and so here's an example of uh, this uh, process in terms of what we call the power spectrum, which has a lot of cosmologic information. I'm not gonna go into details, but basically uh, the pl this plot is supposed to show that within the errors we get a reconstruction. These are the errors, right? We got these errors by constructing the covariance matrix uh, using uh, simulations, all right? So cosmology is all about error quantification. We spend a lot more, more effort on getting the errors than on getting actual, the actual answer, okay? So, Error quantification is really important. Okay, so I want to now translate this um, cosmology, um, the, this, this, the thing we learned in cosmology to, to more general machine learning. Okay, so initial density modes in cosmology would be the latent space. Um, we can talk about uh, latent space dimensionality reduction. I'll show a few slides on that. Forward model becomes a decoder or generator. Uh, cosmology parameters become the parameters of the decoder. And uh, the posterior reconstruction that I was showing uh, is really, you know, we, we can call it as an encoder, right? Basically going from the data back to the latent space. Uh, and uh, here also we need to marginalize uh, over the latent space in order to get um, the decoder parameters. So that's the goal of machine learning. Uh, and the main difference, of course, is that in machine learning we would not have a physics-based uh, forward model. We would just try to learn it from the data. Okay, so um, I thought I would just give a few lessons, a, a few you know, things that we have learned that might be useful for, uh, for machine learning. Okay, here's one lesson. Um, what we found is that um, injective forward models are much easier um, to work with than non-injective. Non-injective means you have many to one, and here's an example that I wanna show. Um, this is what happens to us when we go to very high uh, resolution data. Uh, here we have a data, here's our reconstruction. Reconstruction actually looks perfect. But when you look at the reconstruction that we got of the latent space, we actually don't have a perfect agreement uh, here. Why is that? Because the, the mapping, foreign model mapping is non-injective, right? It has many, many to one. Uh, if we um, downsize um, on the resolution, then you see we actually get a better agreement, at least on the coarse grain <laughs> scale. Because for example, this guy we recover where it wasn't here, right? So uh, injectivity is an important thing to, uh, to keep in the context of um, these four models or generators. Uh, lesson two, um, nonlinear um, uh, generators are easier to, um, to do the mismatch reduction on than linear generators. Uh, here I have an example um, of, uh, so think of it here, we start with white noise, and let's say we just, we just filter out uh, high frequency, we get this, and clearly we see by eye that there's a large difference here. Uh, this was eight times compression, and here we do 64 compression, and so on. Here is when we do the same thing, but now removing um, eight times compression on the nonlinear model. This is, in this case, is an n-body simulation output. Here, there's no difference at all. Why? Because these high-frequency uh, modes, as I mentioned before, have been mapped to such small scales that they don't actually even show up in the nonlinear data. All right. So you can say that's bad because we cannot recover them, but it's also good in the sense that we don't actually need them and therefore we can do dimensionality reduction of the latent space. Okay, so uh, third lesson um, that we have learned is that um, if we do physics-inspired generators, they give better results uh, than the machine learning-inspired generators. Okay, so um, here's an illustrative example. We have a high-resolution uh, embodied simulation data called Illustris. We have a very crappy simulation that we have here, and then we wanna learn um, using this to, to to get something that looks like this. And with this one single parameter of so-called fake force, as we call it, uh, we are able to get this, uh, which is a lot better than this, of course. And that's just one more parameter. Let me give you, uh, you know, maybe a more interesting example, at least from our point of view, is um, here we're trying to learn the outputs of a hydrodynamic simulation, cosmological simulation, again, uh, illustrious. This is the temperature, uh, this is the dark, dark matter, in a simulation, this is a temperature field. You know, basically, uh, big halos, uh, they heat up the gas and they get a very high temperature, whereas in small, you know, in voice, basically there's no heating up the gas and there's nothing happening there. And this is how well we, we are able to train, uh, to learn basically this temperature map, uh, using, in this case, a few parameters, like seven parameters. Again, it's physics-inspired, and that's why we don't need uh, very many parameters. 
But uh, you know, basically, same idea can can work on many different um, uh, applications. For example, here we have ga a galaxy um, stellar mass. You know, now stellar mass happens at very you know at the de at the densest cores of these dark matter halos that I mentioned. So it's it's very it's very different topological structure than here, and still we're able to learn it uh, with seven parameters. Of course, there are different seven parameters, right? But they're still the structure is exactly the same. So the point uh, that I'm trying to make here is that, uh, so this is actually very similar to what we heard in the talks in the, uh, this morning, but uh, the point is that because we only have seven parameters, then the, the subsequent determination of cosmological parameters actually is, we believe, a lot more stable when you only need to learn seven parameters versus when you need to learn thousands of parameters. Okay, and then lesson four, let me skip this one. This has to do with variational, mean field variational uh, uh, inference, uh, which we, you know, we argue it doesn't give accurate results for cosmology applications. Okay, so um, how much time do I have? Oh. Four minutes. Okay, so um, generative models, uh, let me, I don't have time to go through generative models. Uh, there are basically three major classes, variational order encoders, um, normalizing flows, which are bijective, and GANs, gener generative adversarial networks. And you can think of them as a trade-off between um, reconstruction and sampling. Basically, GANs do perfect job on, you know, not perfect, very good job on, sa on samples, but they can't really even reconstruct the data. Um, bijective flows, they reconstruct the data perfectly, and then, you know, they do well or not on the samples. And the VAEs are something in between. Um, we have developed uh, a new autoencoder uh, called Laplace autoencoder. Uh, this work done with uh, these two people who are here. Um, and the idea is that we lower the dimensionality of latent space and that we have a generator which is injective. So again, we're using the, you know, the inspiration that we learned uh, from cosmology. Uh, we also have an encoder uh, which basically learns this map, this inverse model uh, reconstruction in latent space. We don't do anything else beyond that um, in terms of the neural network structure because we use the analytic Hessian uh, as a solution which we can involve, uh, which we can ev uh, evaluate um, with, uh, with backpropagation algorithms. Okay, so you can think of it as a generalization normalizing flows. It has some good properties versus uh, variational autoencoders. For example, uh, this plot is supposed to show that variational autoencoders, because they use this mean field variational inference, they can actually be biased um, in terms of the posterior, whereas uh, MAP plus Laplace is actually much more accurate. Okay, so that's one uh, reason why we think that's good. There's another thing that uh, is bad about variational encoders. They, they lead to so-called uh, latent space collapse. In other words, they start, stop using uh, some of the uh, latent uh, space variables. This is supposed to show here. Basically, we have a latent space collapse in this thing, and we don't have that on our thing. Uh, there's also something good about this uh, compared to the bijective um, normalizing flows. Here we have the same, exactly the same architecture. Um, Bijective, as I said, they're bijective, so they, you know, this is uh, MNIST digits, you know, 794 dimensions. If we try to get samples out of this on this architecture, this, you know, they look like crap. Uh, whereas with our 10 dimensions, uh, they, you know, we, we are able to generate good images. Okay, so um, we uh, thought that the best application for this would be something where you want to use both sampling and reconstruction properties. Okay, and so as I said, this is not something that GANs would do. This is also, you know, maybe not something that uh, bijective flows would do really well. But it is something maybe VAEs would do, except that they're not injective. And so we thought that this is a good place where uh, this, uh, the qualities of this generator can shine. Um, so we have trained, basically, our generator on the standard uh, MNIST digits. Um, and now we ask, how well can we recover these digits when we have corrupted data? Uh, does anybody, can anybody guess what digit is this? Nine. Five, four, I don't know, what else? What about this one? No. <laughs> you have a very good neural network in your brain. <laughs> what about this one? <laughs> okay, so uh, let me show you. Anyway, you know, you can see, right? It's not easy. Uh, here are our results. Um, um, this is the original digit that went in. Yes, it is a four. This is a two. Another four here. And this is how well we reconstructed. Okay, this is basically MAP, okay? Maximum posteriori solution. But the point that I wanna make is we don't want just look at just at the peak of the posterior, we wanna get the full probability distribution of the posterior. Here is what this probability distribution looks for this posterior of this four, the first one I've shown. It turns out it's bimodal. We have two peaks here. 
which roughly correspond to 9 and 4. Okay, so what we do then, in order to represent the posterior, the uncertain quantification, we sample from this latent space, and here is the results in the data space. And uh, you see basically there's a mixture of fours and nines. Um, you see that uh, on the data that we are actually given, they all kind of agree, right? They, as by construction, they're supposed to agree with the, with, the, with the data that we put in. And this was the result basically, as I said, of optimization method to solve this. And um, right, so I think that's it. And uh, here's my summary. Um, we think the cosmology can be useful for, for some of the generative models uh, properties. And uh, if you have any applications where you want to try our Laplace autoencoder, talk to us. Thanks.